It is a special Thursday night edition of Hashtag Beavers Football. We are getting the game going early, getting ready for Washington paying a visit to Oregon State. Thanks for joining us. We're live at Bliss Lad in Southeast Portland. I'm Katie Brown, along with Slade Norris and Tim Ewis, and ready to take your questions over the next hour, Beaver fans. So send in your questions, tweet us, text us, email us. So many ways to join us, or you can come join us live down here uh, this evening. We always love live questions. Oh, Oh, guys, we have so much to talk about. A huge matchup, really, for both teams this weekend with Washington coming to Corvallis. Both teams desperately need this win. Mike Riley talking this week about how there are defining moments. This game is one of those games. You know, Katie, it really is. When you look at where both teams are at at this point in the season, the bowl implications, the, the Pac-12 record implications, it's a huge matchup for both of these teams heading into their rivalry weeks. Both teams come in 6-4 and four overall, so both teams trying to clinch a winning record for the regular season. The Beavers just ahead in the uh, Pac-12 standings. They're 4-3 and three in Pac-12 play. The Huskies, 3-4, and four, and they have very sim they have had very similar Pac-12 seasons, uh, just that Oregon State hasn't played Oregon yet, and Washington already did. So, needless to say, it is a huge, huge game. So, coming out of Arizona State, and of course, Washington lost to UCLA, we're going to be talking about some big things for this game. So for our opening drive, we're going to be talking in the show about the Huskies quarterback injured last week. Keith Price, will we see him in Corvallis on Saturday night or will we not? Also later on the show, Steve Priest will be up to tell us who other than Brandon Cooks is very important to the Beavers passing game. And of course, we may look ahead to a Civil War or Bowl game and talk about some of the things still down the road. So even though the Beavers have lost three straight Graham's still a ton to play for. Eight and four, a big difference from six and six, and there is still a lot to play for in the season. So again, join us, text, tweet us, or email us as we take a look at this. What are the key things when you're looking at Washington right now this weekend that you think the Beavers have been thinking about this weekend, to, this week to get ready? From defense, it's got to be a man named Bishop Sankey. I mean, he runs the ball like an absolute beast. I mean, with Marshawn Lynch up there in Seattle, I'm sure he tries to model his game after him. He's a strong runner, and he fuels their entire offense, especially with the quarterback possibly being out. We don't know that situation quite yet. But with him leading the charge, he's, he's a hard guy to stop. And if we can do that, I think we'll, we'll corner their offense into a place they don't want to be. You know, they're trying to stop that offense, but also they have a very tough defense slate and, and one of the best in the Pac-12 versus the run and the pass. And, and it, it's almost a vanilla defense from time to time. They don't bring a lot of pressures. Uh, but what they do is they play very sound, and especially in that man-to-man -man coverage on the outside. A lot of single high, which is a different look that the Beavers will have to really game plan for this week. And we talked about, uh, talking about in this opening drive, the quarterback situation for Washington. Keith Price, we'll see it a little later on in the show, him being injured uh, against UCLA last week. Still don't know whether or not we're going to see him on Saturday or else if it's going to be the redshirt freshman uh, Siler Miles making his first career start. So today, Keith did practice this morning and uh, Coach Lakeesian said he is vastly improved but not quite ready to name which player will be the start. How do you prepare for that when you're not quite sure you're a day or so out? How do you think Oregon State has approached that this week? First of all, Katie, you know, there's a guy named Rogers in Green Bay that got hit a few weeks ago, and he is vastly improved, but nowhere near ready to play football. So, you know, I look at that hit that, that Price took in that game, and he was driven down onto his shoulder. and His throwing shoulder. His throwing shoulder, and, and the way he came off the field limping, holding that thing, I mean, that was a bad sign to me. And if I'm a defender, Slade, I'm thinking we got to get that guy on the ground if he tries to suit up against the Beavers. Oh, the first thing you want to do as a defender is you want to know where he's hurting and you want to hit him right there, legally, oh, mind Slade, you. Oh, really? <laughs> well, it's I, a part of the game, and it's an aggressive game, and you have to take advantage of everything you have. And that guy really is a game changer for them. And, and the backup came in, threw a couple picks down the stretch down at UCLA. He doesn't have the same presence. He's a great football player, and, and, and he will develop and be much better. He's one of the top recruits 
in the country at that kind of spread zone read quarterback position. But what Price brings to the game, the, the mental aspect, just the throws he's able to complete on the field, not having that guy on the field is a game changer. And this is one of those situations where it's sort of like the curse of playing Oregon State kind of because are at Oregon State because two years ago Price was hurt and a guy named Nick Montana made his start at uh, at Reeser Stadium. Didn't go so well for Washington. Didn't go very well for Washington at all until Price came back in and I swear his ankle was broken. And he came back in and he had that thing wrapped up and almost a boot on it, Katie. And and he came back and played very effectively and then almost led a comeback. And fortunately, the Beavers got away with a victory there. But he, he can change the game, Slade. That is one thing that scares me is watching him last year, their offensive line was really struggling. He was getting sacked in a three-step draw before he even got to his third step. And I felt bad for the guy. What I liked was every time he got right up, he didn't point any fingers, he wasn't talking to anybody, he just got up, ran the play, and did his job. And so I, I respect a player like that. And it's going to be tough. We don't know who he's going to play, but he's a competitor, and we could see him out there. All right, we're going to talk even more about Washington, of course, throughout the show and, and their season because there was a lot of hope for this season for them coming in. But taking a look at the Beavers, of course, another disappointing loss last week at Arizona State. And, you know, it's, it's the good thing and bad thing about these losses. You know, USC thoroughly outplayed Oregon State in that loss. I, don't th I just don't think Oregon State played well, not that they're, you know, the bad team. But they've been in so many of these games, and it's just so frustrating because it's like woulda, shoulda, coulda, you know, when the game is over. But still, when you're coming off of three straight losses, how does that w play mind games with you? It's been a long time now since they've won a game. I think you are hungry for a victory at that point. You want to get that taste of victory back in your mouth. And, and, and you know, all those close By games. By that, you mean the victory wings, right? The victory wings. <laughs> the Raul's preparing up in the kitchen. You're exactly Is right. Is that what victory wings? Victory. You get a victory, Katie. You get victory Taste wings. Really? What happens that? if you lose? What do you get? No Cold. wings. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that is incentive Sorry right there. A little me. inside into the Beavers program. <laughs> they get wings. Put some of that habanero blue cheese on it. It's it. awesome. But no, it, it, they really have to get that victory wing taste back in their mouth. And they're hungry for it. I'll guarantee that. And the way they do that is you got to forget about those losses. And you got to just go out and prepare for the Husky game this Saturday night and, and really put all of your momentum and energy into that and not worry about what happened in the past. Shrug off those bad plays down at Arizona State. The woulda, shoulda, coulda, didn't. You know, focus on catching the punts and, and ball security and some of those little things that did cost them the game. It's hard to break a losing streak on the road against a good team. Obviously, turnovers didn't help us, but it's a lot easier when you come home, you have confidence at home. We've, we've played well there. You know, I, I think uh, just go in, do what you do, and be the team that you know you, you have are. the added momentum of senior night, Slade. Oh, I think that's really good. Really that Final home game, senior yeah. night. A lot of guys walking out. That's always a special night. Yeah. All right, we're just getting started on hashtag Beavers Football. We have a few texts and tweets coming in. We will get to those after the break, so send yours in so you can be a part of this show. And coming up next, we'll take a closer look at that Keith Price injury that may keep him out this weekend and what that could mean for the Beavers. We are so excited for the Beavers home finale though we are coming to you a night early on hashtag beavers football and we're so glad that you're joining us live from blitz lad and we're taking your text and tweets so join the conversation this is your pep rally show these guys have to answer whatever you throw their way whatever you ask them so uh, send in your questions and we are heading into first down now we talked about keith price the huskies quarterback and the iffy situation of whether or not he will play we're going to show you that play uh, at ucla that took him out last week it took him out uh, for the second half of that game and took him out in the second quarter. And uh, the defense got to him and got him down a couple of plays, actually. And it was uh, when they really drove him down that you're going to see coming up here. That was it for him. And that is when Siler Miles came in for the rest of the game and his shoulder, his throwing shoulder, driven into the ground there. And I know neither of you qu quarterbacks, but still when you see that and you see that throwing shoulder going down the ground, you can only imagine, I guess, what that does to his game. Anytime I see a quarterback go down, whether it's Sean Mannion or the opponent, I think, is that guy going to get back up? And I, I think you feel that at any level. 
because it's just never pretty when a quarterback goes down. And usually not the most graceful fallers, Katie. And, and, and the way he came off the field, pointing at that that bicep and that shoulder, you, you had to know something was wrong. And I think they're covering it up a little bit, trying to you know, be a little deceptive that he's going to play, where I think he's going to come in as the backup. And if they need him to try to pull the, you know, the miracle ankle that he did two years ago, he may come in and try to do that. Exactly. Like two years ago, need him in the emergency situation. But you expect that Siler Miles will make his first career start at Reeser Stadium. So when you have that, if you have a, a young quarterback, redshirt freshman, and that first start and coming in, improving himself, obviously, how do you approach that if you're the Beavers. If you're the defense and you see the new guy in there. First, you want to hit him as soon as possible. And second, <laughs> you want the help of the crowd. Uh, honestly, the the Beaver crowd this this year, this uh, this next game will really help him out because getting as loud as possible in there, he can't communicate to his players. There's a little confusion. He's already nervous. He's probably got some butterflies and something before the game. You can get pressure on him early and get to where he can't make his calls. That makes for an awful day for him. So hit him hard early and often. Huh? Early That's and the often. key to it. <laughs> and also just disguising your coverages, too. I mean, a little of that we did earlier in the year with some teams, but some, some late movement would be great. Does that get you a little fired up when you're in the defense, knowing that the quarterback situation is sort of suspect at best, no matter who plays? Oh, that's fresh meat. <laughs> I mean, he's never been hit before this year. He's, he's ready for some hits. <laughs> you know, I, I never played defense in college, but in high school, I always felt that way. You, you have a chance to go after somebody that's inexperienced and, and, and really get after them, rattle their cage early. And especially, like Slate said, if Beaver Nation gets into it, they're bringing the noise, they're, they're bringing the volume. That's a big distraction in a stadium like ours. It definitely is. You love to see when you go up and put your hand down on the line of scrimmage. You look over and you see that quarterback eyes, and he's about he's about like that, and you know we've got him. It's game time. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to a tweet coming in. This is from Joe Bess, who asks, hey, what bowl game would our Beavers most likely play in this year? As we talked about, this is a huge game for bowl implications. You know, there's a couple things there, Katie, going on. We have two games left, obviously, so a lot can happen in that time. But essentially, if we, if we win against Washington, we'll have a, a chance to play in the, the Fight Hunger Bowl in the Bay Area against BYU, who's already accepted a bid to that game as being an unaffiliated school. If we lose, we could actually be left out. Odds are we'd probably go to the New Mexico Bowl, but we could be left out of the bowl, bowl picture all, all the way around because there's so many good teams in the Pac-12 this year that have winning records. Yes, absolutely. In fact, right now there are eight of them. Washington State could make it nine if it beats Utah this weekend, and the Pac-12 has seven guaranteed bowl slots, although there are other options if there are other at-large bids, depending on how other conferences shake out uh, for the rest of the season. And I tell you what, after watching Oregon play last weekend and how Marcus Mariota looks like he can hardly move right now, uh, can't move laterally at least, uh, Civil War, in my opinion, is back up, you know, I mean, it... it I, I agree. Beavers win, too. That could totally change their bowl picture, and and it could change Oregon's bowl picture, obviously, and, and change the whole conference. So I, I, I don't count the Beavers out of either of these games. Absolutely, but Saturday is a big one. All right, we have a text from Nick that says, earlier on the fan, uh, a CSN, a Coach Riley said that Dylan Wynn is playing a little tight end and a little fullback and could be used in the red zone. What do you guys think about that? I love seeing I, Dylan go in in the red zone in the goal line situation, the fourth down situation against uh, Arizona State. And I had to, on DVR, I had to push that rewind, that 30 second rewind. Was that number 45 in there with that funky face mask? And, and he asked Coach to do it. He said, Let me in. I want to do this. You know, and that's proven to be a, a winning combination. Take one of your better D linemen, linebacker types, put him in at fullbacks, lady. You know, they used to do it with guys like Mike Vrabel all the time in, in, in New England and get those guys. It, it, they put Bruschi in there sometimes and get them into the mix. And did you ever have a, you know, a conversation with Coach or say, hey, Coach, I think you play a little fullback? Um, I was a little scared to go to fullback. I've seen the hits they have to lay, and that's uh, brutal with a running start. Dylan likes that violence, though. I did have, yeah, he loves that. I did have to play fullback, though, when I was in the scout team for the Detroit Lions. <laughs> and uh, their defensive line 
It's not very kind. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's nice I, to have Dylan win a guy who's a block of muscle, but still as athletic as he is, to be as versatile a player as he is. It, it's a gem to have for it, Coach Riley. You never know what you can do with play action with those guys, too. He's a good athlete. He can catch the ball. I see those D linemen on the jugs machines after practice, Katie, and he's got hands. He's a good athlete. I think he might even be on the hands team on an onside kick return. So, And what's I, great for the defensive guys, they look over and this guy's a D and he's not going to get the ball. They're exactly. not expecting that. Yeah. All right. Well, there is another reason that the Beavers have extra motivation for this game. Of course, the bowl picture. And then there's last year and the big hit that was not called at all. And coming up next, we will take a look back at the Marcus Wheaton play from last year. And we'll hear from both sides about it. I felt it was a clean hit. I didn't know I, I wasn't intentional. I wasn't trying to hurt him. You know, it's just a game of football. It's a man's game. It's just physical. Welcome back to Hashtag Beavers Football. We are heading into second down now. And boy, we go back a year. And who will ever forget this? It was so tough to watch the hit on Marcus Wheaton by the Huskies. And worst of all, no penalty called on it. Well, both teams are still talking about it. I just knew, I knew that once the ball snapped, I knew I had to get where I got to. The receiver pushed like a couple yards ahead of me. I knew I couldn't get there to make the pick, so I just ran through him. I don't know if it was intentionally, but it, it came out to be a dirty hit. It was helmet to helmet. You know, it should have been the flag. Didn't get a flag. They got a pick turnover ball. So I feel like that was a dirty hit. And I, I'm not saying he, uh, you know, he, he intentionally did that, but that's how it came out to being looked on film. It was a clean hit. I've seen it multiple times uh, on YouTube and all of that stuff. It was a clean hit. He used his shoulder pads. I mean, it's unfortunate. I think he might have got a concussion or something. Of course, when it's one of your guys, it's a dirty hit for sure. But uh, if I was on the other end, I probably wouldn't say it's a dirty hit. But we go out there, you know, try to make plays. And when you're in the heat of the moment, you know, you just go with what happens. And I'm sure he wasn't trying to injure him, but, you know, that's, that's what happened. I felt it was a clean hit. I didn't know. I, I wasn't intentional. I wasn't trying to hurt him. You know, it's just a game of football. It's a man's game. It's just physical. can still remember how scary that was. It was chilling when it first happened and the way Marcus went down didn't move. I thought I thought he was seriously, seriously injured. We thankfully he wasn't and came back to play and have a great game the next week. But no pa I, a shoulder pad hit? What? Were we watching the same play? I don't think we were watching the same play, Katie, because I've seen that hit in the NFL, and that's a $10,000 fine for the first offense. Second offense, it's double in Slade. You've seen those guys get those FedEx envelopes, and that was definitely a lead with the helmet. And, and you know what? I, I agree with what Shad said, too. Our defenders are going to try to take that hit. And, and right, wrong, or indifferent, it's football. It's a violent sport. It was it was an ugly play on one of our players, and we don't like that. And and I think the Beavers are remembering that hit, Slade. Nobody's purposely trying to hurt anybody. I it agree. is a violent sport, like you said. But when you make a mistake and you know it is illegal, fess up to it and don't say it's coming from your shoulder pad. I mean, come on, buddy. We saw the film right there. And that happened early in the second quarter. And that game was huge in the Beavers' season because they went in there, this great record. I mean, they're right in the prime of the BCS and I'm ranked in the top 10, I believe. And then they take a loss at Washington and it changes their season after Marcus Wheaton went out early in the second quarter after nearly having a big play there. So that, that was a huge play in the entire season, really. It really really was a huge play when they're, they're undefeated headed in there and, and you know <laughs> you just look at it again it's just a brutal hit and, and that is part of football and they're trying to protect against those things Katie but that's an ejection with the new rules that are in place for the NCAA. I mean, that he is no longer playing in the game, and, and he may be suspended for the next game. Okay, so that's a year ago. Marcus Wheaton has moved on. He's in the NFL. But do the player this, I mean, how much will they, have they talked about that this week? I know they talked on camera about it, but I mean, is that something in the locker room that they even think about now, or is that past is the past? You protect your family, and, and you don't forget something like that when they knock one of your guys down. You remember that, especially as a defense, I feel like, 
you got to stand up for your own. And this this series between these two teams has, has been violent. Uh, back my junior year, we took out their quarterback, Jake Locker. Ooh, I um, remember Al that. Lava came down. Yeah. And that was a legal hit, in my opinion. And, you know, things happen. <laughs> in my opinion. In my opinion. <laughs> but things happen. And you know what? It just got to move on and, and keep playing. But it still leaves a little burning in there. I, I agree. There will be some chatter. It's going to be intense in that secondary. I'll promise you that, Katie, because I've been around those types of events where in the NFL slate when you're playing a team in your division and you play them the second game oh. that second game is always brutal with trash talk in that secondary with the linebackers wherever that incident occurred so they will be getting after it and I'd, I'd expect that they he's a bit of a marked man they're not going to let him get a hat on too many you know ball carriers yes well if you would like to chime in add your two cents or ask these guys a questions join the conversation here on hashtag beavers football by texting tweeting emailing and we have a live guest ben down here at blitz lad to ask his question in person ben what are you going to ask the guys um, I was wondering if Mannion had a second choice for who he would uh, pass to. I know Cooks is great, but I was feeling like he would have so much more of an offensive advantage if he added a second um, receiver. He ben. had one. He's hurt. Ben, good, good observation. <laughs> 327 passes by Sean Mannion, 100 to Brandon Cooks. He could break the all-time Pac-10, Pac-12 record by the end of this season. Uh, you know, uh, as far as other receivers, Richard Mullaney has almost 50 balls. Connor Hamlet has almost 50 balls. He lost Cummings. You know, Caleb Smith has stepped up in that role. Other guys are filling in, but you're right. He is heavy to Brandon Cooks. I don't feel that's a problem uh, until he starts really staring him down. I don't feel he's done that this season. Almost the opposite at times. He's gone to other guys, and, and I think they're drawing up plays that take advantage of, of extra defenders being on Cooks. And I don't feel like a lot of his interceptions that he threw were to Brandon necessarily. It was spreading out to the other guys. And he really has been hurt with the injuries, with the tight ends going down, with Cummings being out. His his options are a little limited. But as we're getting everybody back, I think he will spread it out a bit more. But Brandon is such an asset. I mean, you've got to get in touch however you can. Hey, there's a couple games where I'm like, we're not getting him the ball enough against USC. I'm like, find that guy. But we didn't really talk about Cummings much earlier. I mean, how much has that loss affected the Beavers? You know, the slot receiver that knows how to run those nifty routes, those crossers, those shallows, is like gold, Katie, because they're few and far between when they understand their role and they don't want more of a role. Cummings was very satisfied with his role as, as somebody to block every play downfield when somebody else caught the ball and to catch a ball in third down situations and, and be a target, a viable target with good hands. And, and, and he really understood what he was there for. I, I look at a guy like Rob Prescott from back in the Fiesta Bowl era. Uh, Mike Cass had that role for a little while when he first started out. Cole Clayson uh, at Oregon State. So there's always kind of been that guy um, that, that plays that slot position, and, and he did a very good job of it. And it's Malik, you know, started filling in last week. Mm -hmm. They got him several touches in the game, and he played well. Uh, but from your perspective, Slade, as a defender, when you bring that third receiver in, what does that do to the defense, especially a guy that you know can catch the ball? It's a game changer there because then you start thinking, well, I mean, do we have to run our nickel package out there? I mean, is he that kind of guy we need to put one of our big cover guys on? I mean, with my senior year, we had Shane Morales. I mean, I think he led us in touchdowns from that position. And he'd come home after every game getting these huge hits, running across the middle, landing on his head. He'd be walking all like this the next morning. But he'd do it every time. That's what comes with position. And Cummings did a great job at that. And, and it's a special guy that can run across the middle, Katie, and take that hit from a linebacker and secure the ball and hold on to it, as you said. And, and, and like you said, with Shane, he led the team in touchdowns for a good portion of that season. Yeah. And, and, and it changes what the defensive coaches are doing. They're up in the, the booth with binoculars looking at the personnel running in and out, trying to figure out what personnel they need to exchange for. So it, it really does change the game having that slot receiver. And I, and I think Malik is growing into that position. All right. Well, it hurts just thinking about being the guy to run through the middle and just be there to get hit. All right. Still to come on hashtag Beavers football, Steve Priest will be up and tell us about a guy who should be getting more catches for the Beavers and how that would help. Watch Sean go to the outside 
Connor Hamlet's size and his length make that an easy throw. Welcome back to Hashtag Beavers Football. I'm Katie Brown along with Slade Norris and Tim Ewis. And in the first half of the show, we talked about, well, how we're not quite sure who's going to be playing quarterback for Washington this week after Keith Price injured his throwing shoulder last week. Back at practice today, but still no starter name. So will it be a kind of injured Keith Price or will it be a red shirt freshman Siler Miles making his first career start in Corvallis this weekend. And we also talked about the Beavers and uh, other parts of Washington game that they're going to have to count for. They have the best running back right now in the Pac-12, who is the fourth uh, leading rusher in the nation with nearly 1,400 yards and 14 touchdowns in Bishop Sankey. So a lot to focus on. And as uh, we head now into the extra point segment, we are going to take a look at a guy, a closer look Steve Priest who is getting the ball more and who really helps the Beavers when he does get it and that is Connor Hamlet here is Steve Priest everybody wants to know what happened to Sean Mannion to Brandon Cooks these last three weeks and what happened the last two weeks with seven interceptions to Sean Mannion I'm here to tell you nothing has happened. Sean Mannion still leads the Pac-12 with 395 yards a game. He's got 33 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. That's a marvelous ratio so far. He's throwing the ball at 67, 68%, and he's doing a great job of reading his progressions. Brandon Cooks, on the other hand, leads the nation. He's got 100 receptions. He's uh, leading the nation also in yardage. He's got 10.1 uh, catches per game, and if he continues on at that pace for two more games, he sets an all-time Pac-12, Pac-10 record for season receptions. It'll be 120 over Marquise Lee, who won last year's Blitnikoff Award, and that's an award that Brandon was a semifinalist this week, just named. Oregon State's problem in the passing game has been injuries more than anything else. They lost Kevin Cummins, a great receiver, senior. He could get in the cracks. He could get in the seams. He knew what to do in the third down situations and inside the red zone. They also were missing Caleb Smith, and they had Connor Hamlet gone off and on for four weeks. When they came back, the Beavers played really well, and Connor Hamlet was the first Beaver besides Brandon Cooks to get 100 yards in a game. Last week, 119 nine catches. We're going to take a look at how Brandon, uh, excuse me, how Connor gets those receptions. He does it with skill, he does it with size, and he does it by taking advantage of Brandon Cooks. This is early in the year. It's Eastern Washington. You saw the two backs. There's Brandon Cooks, and here's Connor Hamlet right next to him. He's coming in motion. Short yardage. Here comes Connor in motion. He's going to take a brush block. He's going to go right at the safety, fake to the safety, and the safety is going to make a play on the ball. When he makes a play on the ball to make the tackle, look at Connor. He's wide open. Easy target for Sean Mannion. Second one against Washington State a little later in the season. You see Sean right there. It's a one back. He's going to fake it again. Connor, in this case, he's on the outside. He's a Y back. He's going to go down the field, take advantage of Sean rolling to the outside, give Sean a better angle at a great big body. Watch the play fake. Watch Sean go to the outside. Connor Hamlet's size and his length make that an easy throw. It's tremendous to have a 6'7 receiver. This is my favorite, though. Take a look at this. That's Brandon Cooks, and right inside is Connor Hamlet. The safety and the corner, these two guys are going to be tied up, and they're going to say, we're covering Brandon Cooks, and they make a horrible mistake in doing that. And this is the kind of thing that Oregon State's receivers are able to take advantage of. The emphasis the defense places on Cooks. When we see this close-up of this long touchdown to Hamlet, you're going to see the real humor in this situation. Corner, safety, they both jump it to the inside. Easy play for Connor right there, and it's an easy touchdown. If the Beavers continue to dish the ball out to the other receivers, get Storm Woods, Teron Ward involved, and if they can cut out the turnovers. The first seven weeks of the season, the Beavers were at six and one, and they were plus 11 in turnover margin. The last three games, they're minus four, and they're 0 and three. It's huge. 
get rid of the turnovers and Sean Mannion, be Sean Mannion, and Brandon Cooks and the other receivers play the way you've been playing. You'll win this football game against Washington this coming Saturday. Thank you, Steve Priest, for that extra point. And turnovers really have been the story the last couple of games. They haven't been able to capitalize like last week we saw when they got two early turnovers against Arizona State, and then they've been losing the turnover battle. You know, Katie, I talked about it on my blog, and I was even tweeting it during the game. The turnover battle was going to be the difference. I said the Beavers had to be plus two mm -hmm. in the turnovers to win. And, and we started out, all of a sudden we're plus two. And I'm like, oh, well, they better win because that's what I said. And, and all of a sudden there's an interception, and it's down to, to one, and then minus one, and then a, a fumble punt and that's another turnover and all of a sudden we're at minus three and in the probability of winning when you're at minus three is extremely low so the Beavers have to figure out how to take care of the football and win that turnover battle I will say two of Sean's interceptions on fourth down basically that turns into a punt well that was actually good that he intercepted it instead of uh, knocking, knocking it, it down. down I agree it yeah. turns into a punt almost and I think that's what Sean was thinking and and then the other one was tipped you know and, and that that's a tough one-on-one -on -one matchup with Sutton and, and say Malu and, and he just got you know but basically his index finger on the ball but it, it tipped it off enough Slade and you've been able to tip balls like that and just the pressure that Sean's facing right now I don't think the the fans realize how close the defensive linemen are getting every play the way I see it Sean really made two bad decisions that game in my opinion the pick six the pick six yeah and then uh, which other there was there's two ones in there that I thought you know what y you can't do that the rest of them though it's not really his fault. He's getting pressure up in his face. Guys are coming at him for all directions. He's just trying to make plays because it really has been all on his shoulders without yeah. the running game. Yeah. So uh, the, the fans they need to lay off a little bit um, and kind of focus on the rest of the team and how can we help Sean be as good as he no, is. No, he did get 90 yards on the ground before you took we away did. the negative plays. So the, the running game was there. They did try to, to make the O-line push that, that pile forward. Which is really something we can focus on this this week. Uh, Washington coming in is, is ninth in ninth the back 12 in, uh, in rush defense. So if we can get that run game going, really help Sean out from the start, that's a game changer. All right. Well, we want you to join our conversation by texting, tweeting, emailing in, and we have Beaver Believer now. It's actually a two-part question. We'll start with the first part here. Why in the last couple of weeks has it seemed that our offense has come out flat and without urgency? Like what you're talking about now, I will say that it, early in the season, they were scoring. The defense just couldn't stop other people. And now they seem to have trouble getting a rhythm going. I don't know if it's so much a rhythm, Katie, but it, there's some play calling there that it's kind of a, a, an art form. And, and what, what I mean by that is, you start out with some plays that you think will work and, and where the Beavers have been really good and I think the fans have to be happy is at the halftime adjustments and and I see it all over Twitter, I see it on, on, on the internet. We need to get Brandon Cooks the ball on the fly sweep. Why haven't we gone to the fly sweep? Well, they, they make those halftime adjustments. They get Brandon the ball on the fly sweep. They started getting the ball to the tight end in the second half and and so I think that's the strength of what the Beavers do. We'd love to come out early and, and strike right off the bat but sometimes the other team game plans too and has a plan to try to beat you. I think it's those halftime adjustments and, and maybe maybe we'd like to see them a little earlier, but it's really those adjustments are what matters. And, and the Beavers did a great job of adjusting in the second half at Arizona State. I completely agree. Uh, On defense, they gave up three points. So, I mean, they really adjusted the well. The defense play. has been playing well. I've been extremely proud of the way the guys have played. Um, they really took it to heart earlier in the season, decided to come back and actually play football. And, I mean, they're doing fantastic. Holding a team like Arizona State down to three points in the second half and playing the way they have been. Uh, they just need to continue it. I mean, they got a, a whole different kind of attack this week. Uh, they faced a good running back last week, but Sankey's even, even better, in my opinion. So we'll see how they can do. All right. Well, we'll have the second part of that text when we come back, and it has to do with two players that we've been questioning all season. So we will get to that. Plus, we have a special guest at the mic as we get ready for Oregon State at Washington. We'll be back with hashtag Beavers football. with us on this special Thursday night edition of Hashtag Beavers Football. Here is the second part of the text that we talked about before the break from Beaver Believer. Do you feel that Cooks and Mannion will both be back next year with unfinished business? You know, guys, it seems like just a few weeks ago we were talking about 
Ty's Mannion, and he was in that conversation, and Brandon Cooks, and will both these guys go to the NFL? What are your thoughts now through uh, at this point in the season, through 10 games? You know, before the three losses, if they'd have won those three games and had kind of that streak alive and kept putting up those numbers, I think there is a strong story for them to leave for the NFL, but I do believe they have unfinished business, Katie, and I think Beaver Nation is excited to hear that. Uh, I, they're both obviously very good, very talented players. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see what Brandon decides, especially if he wins the Blinikoff trophy, just based on what happened with Marquise Lee this year and, and the injury that he sustained early on in the USC season. So uh, Brandon has really proven himself. I think Sean's going to want to come back and and show that his decision making will again go to the next level. I agree. You, you stole my, my statement there with the Blitnikoff. Um, but yeah, Sean has played amazing, but he, he's made some decisions and think he wants to come back and show another year of making, you know, all great ones. And so. I think this team knows there's something special there. They just have to put a full game together. You know, I, every week it's offense, defense, special teams, and, and two of the three seem to shine, or, or last week really one of the three shined. And, and I, they got to put that full package together, and then they have a chance to do something very special. And that's why it's been so frustrating at times because you walk away the la two of the last three games thinking it could have gone the other way. Very definitely could have. Okay, we have a special guest now. You know, there is a guy that we all know who played for Oregon, and when I we spoke with him one time, he said that he was recruited by both Oregon and Oregon State, and if he went just based on the coach, he would have gone to Oregon State because he loves Mike Riley. Is that on the record, Katie? Well, it's off the record. <laughs> it's on the record now. <laughs> anyway, and now I'm starting to really believe it because check him out. He's got an orange vest. We have Carson from Coeur d'Alene with a question. Well, I promise you I won't be wearing this next week. <laughs> uh, and so that's my question's about. I ask you about the Oregon State defense. You guys know them a lot better than I do. Uh, ever since they gave up like 92 points to Division One AA Eastern Washington uh, and lost. 92. <laughs> made Eastern Washington look like just the most dominant offense in the country. And then a couple other offenses after that look like dominant offenses. Uh, they've gotten better. And they've Mike rallied their way all the way to holding Stanford to 20 points. And all of a sudden, they look like a real, a real Division I football unit. <laughs> Face Oregon next week. Is it, uh, what, what do you guys honestly expect? Do you, think they, do you think they have what it takes to slow down Oregon? Or do you think they revert back to that, e, that, 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 that same unit that let a D1AA team just do whatever they wanted all over them? Uh, if they're like me, I'm going to say something first and you can answer. If they're like me and watched Oregon's game last week and the way that Marcus Merida cannot move right now, they are licking their chops for the Civil War right now. I think they're hoping that he maintains that same knee injury through the Civil War. But uh, more importantly, I think when you look at a team like Washington, then a team like Oregon, Washington, well, first Arizona State, 515 yards a game. Washington, 505 yards a game. Oregon's got to be up there. All of these are extremely high-powered offenses. But to Carson's point, the Beavers have figured out how to stop them. Holding, holding uh, Arizona State to under 350 yards last week was, was an accomplishment all in itself, Slade. And I think that really speaks to Coach Banker's game planning ability. And, and something different this year, especially after that Eastern Washington game, guys' ability to, to buy in to the scheme and not try to do more than they're asked to do. Really just playing. And, and Coach Banker's even called it boring, you know, football. It's just boring, fundamental football. What are your thoughts when you had to attack one of those those uh, spread defense or spread offenses, Slade? Was it just boring to you? Well, I got to say first, you know, that color looks a lot better on you than that, <laughs> that ugly green. You do yellow. look good in orange, Carson. I mean, it, you it, do. it makes you look almost handsome. So. I can't help what I look good in. <laughs> but to get back to your question, when we played, it, it was difficult because we didn't see a lot of those offenses. It, it wasn't hadn't gained all the popularity that it has now, and so... It's nice for these guys coming in. They've they've seen it a couple times this year. They've game planned against it. Of course, Oregon does some things different, but I really think that from the reps we've had and we've kind of taken it all year long, it's not just prepare one week and go play Oregon. I think we'll have a lot more success. And plus, I'm not gonna lie, I, I believe we're a more athletic team now than than we had back then. We got some guys playing linebacker that can really run. We got we kind of speed all over the game there, so when they isolate us one-on-one, -on -one, I think we'll be able to handle that. Plus, a hobbled quarterback will always help. 
Well, I will say, Oregon State's defense has stepped up. It was a little scary early in the season, wondering what's happened to these guys and are they going to come to the party, but they really have. I, I think part of that, too, Katie, is, is the ability to game plan and Coach Riley's staff and, and Coach Banker especially. And, and I don't know if the fans really appreciate how difficult it is to, to prepare for a team like Eastern Washington on a very limited amount of film and, and put a good game plan together further on in the season. You have every Pac-12 game now when you go up to face Washington, when you go up to face Oregon. You just can collect so much more information and data with the computer systems that they have available, and we've heard Coach Riley talk about that before. And, and you can put a, a really solid game plan together based on what they're actually doing, not guessing off what they can do from the year before. And so, to me, I think we can have a great game plan against Washington. They're going to do all kinds of things, Katie. They like the unbalanced formations. Coach Sarkeesian is very creative in what he does offensively, and it's honestly totally different than what Oregon does. They go back to the pocket passing against Washington. Uh, they, they do some spread rollout stuff. Uh, they do the pistol. That's not really an Oregon bread and butter running pistol. So I think they're very different offenses, but they have that same explosive ability. To get back a little bit with what you were saying with just doing your job with Coach Banker, when, with, with my senior year, uh, we, we did not play well at the beginning of the season. We lost to Stanford. We got killed by Penn State. And I was guilty of it. I was trying to do more than what was asked of me. I was trying to, to fill my gap and for the linebackers behind me because I didn't necessarily completely trust the whole team. And so with that, just doing your job, just filling your hole, it might be boring at some times. You might just not make the huge play, but you do your job and you'll win the game. All right. Well, when we come back, it is the standard TV and appliance. What to watch for against the Huskies. Plus, Tim and Slade will give you their predictions for the final outcome of the game. It is time for the standard under TV and Appliance, what to watch for against Washington at Reeser Stadium come Saturday. Final home game. It is senior night. Huge matchup for bowl implications. Beavers looking to clinch a winning record for the season. A lot at stake. What are we watching for, Slade? You know, UCLA found a weakness with Washington's offense. The weakness is defensive players. The first five touchdowns scored were from a past linebacker and defensive end. Five touchdowns. So the key to this game, Dylan Wynn, defensive end, coming in on offense, fantasy points, boom. You heard it here first. That's more Boom. home. That's more homer than me <laughs> going for tight ends every week. He's saying now play the defensive players on offense. I, I do like it, though. I like Dylan Wynn playing that fullback position. That'll be fun. My key to this game, Katie, is looking at what Washington has been able to hold their opponents to. 380 yards on the, on the average. And, and the Beavers have almost held theirs to the same, about around 380 yards. And my key to this game is Sean Mannion throwing for 380 yards against the number one pass defense in the conference. And, and I really believe Sean's decision-making will improve and he can throw the ball, air it out. I'd like to see him go for 350-plus. For and, and if he gets that 380 mark and breaks their average you know, defensive stopping point, I, I think the Beavers have a great probability of winning this game. One thing have not pointed out that Washington has not won on the road in the Pac-12 this year. They are winless on the road, so hopefully the Beavers take advantage of that in Corvallis. The fans are nice and loud and make it a nice senior night. One part of the game that we haven't talked about yet for the sixth straight week, not straight week, but straight game, the Beavers will be playing a night game. Unbelievable to have that many in a row. And Mr. Beaver State texts in from a player's perspective, when playing at home, does one prefer day or night games? I think it's really a personal preference. Uh, some guys like the day to relax in the hotel, to get to watch some of the other games and see how those things play out. And some guys just hate being in the hotel, have butterflies all night long, can't wait to get out there and get it over with and go have some fun. Uh, me personally, I like sort of the afternoon-ish games. Get a little sleep in there. You don't have to wait too long in the hotel before you get the to go play. The 4 o'clock game. Yeah, I mean, th those were okay. Even the, the 1, one o'clock game, game, maybe. Uh, I liked those. What about you? I liked starting the game in daylight, finishing the game, you know, coming out of halftime and having it be dark and the lights on and it's Saturday night lights and you're ready to go. You know, and the other thing, Katie, is it seems like these games keep getting later and later and later. 7.30. 7.30 start. But more importantly, a home game, I didn't care what time it was. 
because you're at home. The, the ones that are tough are those night games on the road where you have to fly back. I mean, the team's getting back at 3, 4, 5, 6 in the morning from these long road trips. And, and so a home game, it doesn't bother me what time to start at as a player. I, I kind of enjoyed some of those night atmospheres. Well, if nothing else, they're used to it by this point because it has been a long time back in September since they have played a day game, believe it or not. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of Hashtag Beavers Football before Oregon State takes on Washington. We'll be back next week on Wednesday night, the night before Thanksgiving, to get you ready for the Civil War. So join us then. We'll see you. Thanks for joining us.